Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. I'm Natasha Williams. I am an anchor with Louisiana's Estate Win, and I am happy to be here as a moderator. First, I'd like to go to the panel and ask them a few questions. They just witnessed the play that we had, and I'd like to know, whoever would, would like to speak, uh, your feelings about the play, what you liked about it, what you thought about it, what thoughts came to your mind. Um, Mayor Sharon Weston Bloom. First of all, let me just say that, uh, let me just say that, that I uh, felt that, uh, first of all, uh, our actors deserve another round of applause because it was an excellent performance. I had never seen it before. I've known the author for quite some time and uh, was just really delighted to have an opportunity to see it. But I will tell you that I felt it was very uh, authentic. Uh, I believe it was very, the voices were indeed representative of um, the realities that took place during 2016. And um, I, I heard someone else say um, it was very emotional in, in many respects, um, but it, for many of us, it caused us to relive those experiences of 2016, uh, which I believe we are still healing from uh, thus, the recast program, and um, I just want to thank all of our partners. This is more than you ask for, though, who are helping this community uh, to heal. I don't think people realize how events like that can have an impact on an entire community in different ways. And all of those incidents that took place in 2016 uh, certainly um, still have an impact on us. We're healing from them, but they uh, undoubtedly had a profound impact on us. And I'll make a disclaimer. I was not the mayor in 2016. Uh, I was running for mayor, and uh, my home was flooded as I was running for mayor. So uh, I know firsthand about the flood. I know firsthand about uh, the day Alton Sterling uh, was killed, and I know firsthand about when those three officers were ambushed and killed. So even though I was not the mayor, I, um, I lived through it with the other members of this community. And then after becoming mayor, uh, one of my goals was to um, move us towards uniting around shared goals that would bring us closer to healing as a community. So you basically came in to inherit a lot of the faces of trauma. I did. I did. Anyone else? <laughs> She's like, I got not all at once. I'm not ready to. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll follow. You know, when, when I was looking at it, it made me realize how we all have different life experiences. And not just life experiences, experiences uh, uh, through the incidents uh, here in Baton Rouge. But it made me realize how we, we, as a community, we have to be sensitive to the trauma that this community uh, uh, has faced and on all sides. And, and how important it is to understand that. Uh, because we all heal differently, right, uh, at, at, at our own pace. And we have to be very respectful of that. I want to back up a little bit. Um, I kind of jumped in here because I know we're a little short on time, but I'd like everyone to take the time to introduce who they are and who they represent, and then we'll jump right back in. I don't think her microphone is on. Okay. 
All right, let's try again. <laughs> uh, I'm Caitlin Levine. I work with the Louisiana Department of Health, and I coordinate a statewide program providing education about adverse childhood experiences and their effect on uh, development and long-term health effects. And I'm Murphy Paul, the Chief of Police of the Baton Rouge Police Department. Um, Clarence Nero, I'm a professor here at Baton Rouge Community College. I teach English and creative writing, also the producer and writer for the um, stage play version of Voices from the Bayou. Sharon Weston Broom. <laughs> That's when you know you need no introduction. That's what you do. You all know who I am. As we should, as we should. Uh, Lamont Rucker, um, actor, activist, educator. So just uh, pleased to be here and um, you know invested in this work and in this healing with you. Uh, my name is Brian Nugent. I'm the deputy police chief in Avon, Indiana. Um, we're uh, approached by Daryl to be here as part of the recast uh, program and uh, our story of myself and Ramil Pitambra here. Uh, we actually have a pretty unique story that was uh, aired at the national level on CBS News uh, back in June. Uh, Ramil was uh, involved in a robbery, and I was the detective that arrested him. And uh, we actually reconnected uh, our relationship uh, about two years ago, where he asked me to be his mentor. And so uh, that was kind of why we were brought here today. And so I'll let Ramil talk a little bit more about that. Uh, he introduced the majority of me, but overall, Overall, my name is Ramil Patan, and I'm here to demonstrate to you one of the many faces of trauma and resiliency. Wow. Okay, I'm going to, since you brought that up, <laughs> let's go back and kind of go to the beginning of that, because you kind of dropped that on us. And so let's, let's go to the beginning of how your relationship began and tell us that story. Yeah, so in January of 2013, uh, I was working as an investigator, and I was notified of an armed robbery that had taken place. Um, I remember going out about 1 in the morning to work on that investigation. Uh, very quickly, we began to identify the persons involved in that case. Um, probably about three or four days later, uh, actually made contact with Ramil. At that time, he was 17 years old. A uh, 17-year-old young man who was uh, really struggling with a lot, of, a lot of issues that he had dealt with in his life. And to be perfectly honest with you, I was not 100% aware of all of those uh, traumas that he had been through. Um, we actually interviewed, uh, interviewed him during that case, and um, I did see a lot of the lashing out, right? I saw a lot of the anger that was coming from him. I saw a lot of that um, kind of unresolved issues. Uh, but I just kind of chose not to respond to that and really focus on him as a person. And, um, you know, at the time, didn't really think too much more about the case. Uh, Ramil was very cooperative, took 100% responsibility and accountability for everything that took place, uh, which you don't see that often. You see a lot of people that use that as an excuse. They use that as a, a declaration that what they decide to do is okay. And so uh, Ramil was actually uh, sent to prison. He spent four years in prison. And uh, just by chance encounter, um, he had landed a job at a Goodwill store in Avon. And after church one day, I went to go drop some stuff off with my daughter. And he was the individual that accepted our donation. And uh, the courage that he had to see me and to approach me and identify himself as the person that was involved in that robbery, uh, it just was a really emotional time for myself. And so uh, during that time frame, we connected. We had a lot of conversation. Uh, he asked me to be his mentor, and uh, the last two years we've developed a very good friendship, and it's, uh, it's gotten a lot of attention, and so I know it meant a lot of different things to him as well, if you want to speak to that, Ramil. I'll have to look that story up. I definitely haven't heard that one, but that is <laughs> definitely different than most things I've heard and seen, and I've seen and heard a lot. Let's share your story. Uh, well, like the mayor said, uh, a disclaimer. Um, this morning I shared uh, an introduction and then at our breakout session, a lot of people got to hear in depth the story and my life experiences. But um, to sum it up, uh, I had extensive sexual abuse and uh, molestation in my life. And I was surrounded by alcoholism and drug addiction and uh, anger and hurt. And one thing led to another that led to me robbing Little Caesars. Um, and I found someone that had admirable traits that I could embody within Brian. 
or Brian, and that led us here. Um, for those of you that didn't hear the complete story, that is it in a snippet, if that answers your question. Oh, pretty good. Thank you. Wow. That's a good start. Let's, let's delve into how trauma has manifested itself in the city of Baton Rouge. Um, who's willing to take that on? We've talked about all the... Oh. Well, I want to take that just because you got me talking about it. Okay. <laughs> Go with it. Go with it. Well, and, and I came here today to talk about trauma, and what I've seen is a city saturated with trauma, hmm. a city saturated with hurt, a city saturated with the energy from the trauma, but like I said, and what, what I talked about earlier, once you get in touch with that, it then becomes your responsibility. It then becomes your choice. You don't dwell in it. You never dwell in it. You deal with it and you process it. But after you process the trauma and you become truthful with self, the question, real, then, then the responsibility then transfers from victimhood to responsibility. That's right. And when do you make that decision? Because that's only your decision to make. And um, that is from the production, I see pain, a lot of pain and emotions. But what is the truth of it? And self, when do you deal with self? How did you get beyond that? Because that's a big step to go from you know, robbing, you know, I'm caught up in my drama in my mind and all that I'm going through, but I got to get to the other side. What was it? What was the thing that led you to go the right way, to get on the right path? What led me to get on the right path was, so today I learned about resiliency and a lot of people did, and they used the term and talked about how a child that is broken, and I'm paraphrasing, but a child that is broken can be attached to an adult and uh, reciprocate the energy of a healed individual. That's not what they said verbatim, but it's what they said. So what healed me was when I was in prison, I sat down with an individual that forced me to live in my truth. Well, I could not admit that I had been molested. I could not admit that I was a victim. I couldn't admit that I allowed my younger brother to be molested when I was six years old and I didn't step in and save him. I couldn't admit these truths. So the path for healing was to sit in the belly of the truth and accept the pain, to accept the trauma, to accept the insecurities. And after sitting in that and processing that, then you move to choice. And I made the choice that I will have a good life. All right. When we talk about the manif manifestation of uh, trauma in the city of Baton Rouge, you saw the different stories acted out in the play um, from the pain of the, of the woman who uh, suffered Katrina and then had to suffer Baton Rouge. Um, a double whammy. You know, she had to relive both of those. Um, the one young woman who's from a smaller town, what she had faced when she had to go back and see her home destroyed. Um, how do you, as uh, leaders in the community, advise people to move beyond those types of circumstances, different from the gentlemen's here? I think uh, one of the things that we try to share through the education we do about adverse childhood experiences is that Research has shown us that the parts of the brain that can be most affected by early childhood adversity are the ones that are most important for seeing possibility for the future and for planning to reach those goals, right? So some, for some people, it has to start with your self-concept, like you're saying, with that initial, I'm willing to get to know myself. I'm willing to tell my story my own way and take control back. You know, Samza talks about these trauma-informed principles and empowerment and autonomy are really important features of those that we see working when they're operationalized in different kinds of programs in a lot of different settings. I'll hop in there too. So as a fellow educator and, um, you know, 
again, family counselor and, and, and someone with, again, the training in, in some of these healing methodologies and so forth. I mean, there's some really interesting things. We talked earlier about um, things that people have a concept of as, as kind of intangible. They actually are very actually quantifiable, right? So the reality is most of us think that something that you do with the brain is more important than what you do with the heart. And it's actually the opposite. The heart is actually even, it's, it's even, it's again, right? There's all kind of other arguments uh, counter to this, but the heart develops before the brain, right? Um, as we also know, sometimes inversely, someone can be com quote unquote brain dead, but the heart's still beating. So the most resilient organ, the most resilient part of us, the thing that no matter what we think, what we've been taught, what we've read, how we've been conditioned, the one thing we all have in common is the power and the brilliance and the beauty of the heart. And that's unfortunately how people stop communicating. And when they stop communicating and stop connecting in that way, because it's hard to quantify and you can't quote unquote prove it, or it makes you feel soft, or for all the tough guys, they feel like they're sissies or whatever stupid language you want to use, right? People fight against the very natural and humane and actually the, the, the largest place even where God lives and works through each and every one of us is the heart. And learning how to speak to the heart and speak from the heart typically solves so many problems, but it's shutting down the brain, so to speak. It's getting the ego out of the way, not to let what might look like obvious contrasts, right, get in the way when in reality, this is two of the same, but maybe different journeys, different origins, different families. But when you move all the mess out of the way, who, who are we talking to? Often, times we're talking to ourselves, right? So there are ways to do that in a very um, professional way. There are qualified, certified people who understand how to help you work through the process uh, for yourself and the process of empowering each other the way we all do through the many ways that we have to do that. So the privilege that I've had is to have had this training but also as a literary person, in particular the creative spirit in me here on stage and otherwise, it's how do we get this stuff out, right? And then the place that I realized I had been moved the most is sitting out there. And then you have start having the courage to come up here, you know, and just like Ramil said, you come up here and then you have the courage to spill your guts, then that takes you to a whole nother place. So if you can get in the habit of telling the truth, no matter what side of the conversation you're on, incredible you know, things happen. So it's about clearing away the mess, not being afraid to listen to ourselves and to our hearts and to our spirits in silence, and then speak to each other in love, from love, listen in love, and infinite things happen from there. But we get out of the habit of, of doing it, you know? I mean, trust me, even from a scientific standpoint, I'm talking about, like, I could go super deep with this scientifically and even talk about some real ethereal stuff, but even from as far as a magnetic field, the magnetic field that surrounds and expands from the heart is 20 times the energy that comes from the head and the brain. That seems pretty deep. But let's circle back a little bit. How do you get people to get to that point, though? You know, we talk, this was a journey that it took him to get there. And, it, you know, he was in prison for four years, and he kind of lived through this process and had to work to get there. So how do we get people who are struggling with their trauma to open up, to admit? It's easier said than done. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, that's what I think the arts is great for, right? That's also, that's, I mean, we've got, I, th I understand we have faith leaders. I'm not really a preacher, but I play one on TV. But again, to the heart, 
I'm still that, right? You know, even earlier, right? Some of the words I shared was, we're all children of God. So we've got to understand that this is all a process, and we all get there in different ways at different times. And no matter what, it's not a matter of if you've been through trauma. It's a matter of what kind, when, for how long, right? So a big part, like one of the things I live by is the sooner you get to it, the sooner you get through it. And what often happens, um, and again, this isn't shameless promotion. I realized what I was about to say. But just like the Greenleaf family, <laughs> you sweep stuff up under the rug, right? And the same thing that went on with my grandparents is the same thing that happens to my mother and my aunt and my mm -hmm. uncle. And then it's the same thing that happens to my sister. And then the same thing that happens with me and my relationship, right, with my character's wife. And then the same thing happens in some form or fashion with my daughter. Mm -hmm. The cycles continue when you don't get to the truth. The sooner you get to the truth, the sooner you can acknowledge it, admit it, take accountability for it, identify it, call it for what it is, mm -hmm. look yourself in the face, and then it even gives you the opportunity to not live in shame. But that's also a process. Because at some point, yeah, you feel bad. There might be physical pain, there's spiritual pain, emotional pain, there's embarrassment, there's loss, there's this, that, and the, and the third. Mm -hmm. But it's a process, and that's the thing. You've got to be open to getting to and committing to the process, whatever the process may be. And ideally, the process isn't incarceration and arrest and so forth before you can say, okay, let me finally deal with this. But even if it is, I mean, the brilliance and articulation coming from you, man, is so incredibly inspiring. Like, seriously, I'm, we're, we're, Mayor Broom and I are over here like shaking our heads like, this boy is brilliant. Yeah. So it just speaks to, again, how much brilliance is behind bars. Mm -hmm. It speaks, again, to how much brilliance, untapped, unrealized, unrecognized brilliance is six feet deep. Mm -hmm. How much brilliance isn't even born. Mm -hmm. And he's not the only brilliant one here. We got two people here who finally at least said, hey, not only do we have the opportunity to take one step, let's embrace the choice of taking the next step and then the next and then the next and then the next. Now it's a whole different kind of inertia that's happening where now just this fireworks. It's all this incredible stuff that happens, but you have to be committed to the process. You at least have to take the step to see yourself for what it is, see yourself for what you are, right? Just tell the truth. And then as soon as you can start doing that, then there's other steps you take, and then it's just one day at a time. Every healing, every counseling concept, however many steps of a program, right, is one day, one moment, one choice at a time. And it's, it's that simple, but it's hard to do by yourself, right? So you're not alone, but you're the one who has to do it, right? And that's, that's the challenge of it. So get help. Don't be too proud or too afraid or too egotistical or too ashamed to get help. You, you can none get of to us, the other side. None of us do this by ourselves. Even those of us that sound like we know what we're talking about. None of us do this by ourselves or have gotten this far even by ourselves. Does, uh, we'd like to take this time to ask anyone in the audience if they have any questions they'd like to pose to the panel. Stand up and say your name. Here, come away from the monitor so I can hand this to you. Salutation, my name is Kimberly. Um, go. And um, I, first and foremost, I wanna say how proud I am. Um, I'm a social worker in training, uh, last leg, and when I see your story, it makes me realize that there is hope, that we can make a difference. Um, my question to you, um, experiencing you know, some of the things that you experience, how could we, um, as a preventative me measure, or you know, uh, someone in the school system, how do you feel like we could have been able to reach you more, um, maybe as a, a youth, um, to perhaps? Uh, to reach me? To prevent me from what exactly? Well, when I say prevent, prevent, I'm sure you know there were things prior to that that led to that. Um, was there uh, anyone you felt like you could reach out to, or do you feel like there's you know systems that could have been in place that we could have done a better job, whether it was in the school system, church, or you know whatever community? What what would you say from your perspective that could have 
spoke to that? Uh, from my perspective and from my awareness, I demonstrated blatant signs of sexual trauma that the teachers didn't know looked like. So I would say that if the education system or educators can be educated on the tools and the training of what to look for, then they'll see it. Because sexual abuse is blatant. Physical abuse is blatant. Drug addiction, drug addiction is blatant. And if you know what it looks like, then you know how to see it. Um, because anger is, if you can see anger and understand just the concept of anger, then you understand that anger is secondary emotion. You understand that anger comes from a place of sadness and fear. You got a kid that's constantly mad, they're constantly in fear, constantly sad. And as an educator, if you can see that, you can reach him. Yeah. But I, I would also advise too, educators can't overinvest because you'll lose yourself and then you'll lose the child. But if that helps you. Thank you. Wow. I appreciate it. Mm. And, and just to piggyback off that okay. conversation as well, you know, you talk about like the question being, you know, what can you do ahead of time to be seen? And, and but what an excellent point from Ramil to talk about, you know, giving that information to educators to be aware of that. And one of the things that really kind of just piggybacking off what he said was he actually was encountered to discuss this issue by a cellmate in prison. And what is maybe the most disappointing, but yet most enlightening component of that conversation is that at the age of 17, when he decided to go do something really bad and go do a robbery, these signs were there leading up to the age of 17. How did our system, how did our society drop the ball in education, public safety, counseling, whatever that may have looked like, even within the family, to see that? And to think that a guy sitting in a cell next to him saw that and pulled that out from him, I think is just remarkable. Not only does it speak to the courage of Ramil, but it speaks to your question about what can we do to see that before it's post-arrest and inside of that jail cell. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Good job, Ramil. I, I wanted, oh, somebody had a question? I'm sorry. I wanted to add this, too, because um, as a person who's in a leadership role, uh, I am constantly evolving and learning. And uh, when I sit down and uh, have conversations um, with our leaders of RECAST, and they start explaining to me and my uh, director of the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative, they started talking to me about ACES training was not on my radar, I didn't know anything about it. But when they started unfolding that to me, it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense that the partners that we have are trained in this so that they can be a part of a network. That's why this work that we're doing, or that you all are doing, is so important because you all become the boots on the ground to help identify trauma, to help identify young people that you encounter with your youth programs or at church or in your classrooms when you say, aha, this is a symptom of someone who has had, in Ramil's case, sexual trauma, or maybe there's a child who's demonstrating anger that has not been historically demonstrating anger, and maybe the teacher finds out that the parents are separated or going through a divorce, you know. That all of these things take a heightened sensitivity, but they also take training and awareness. And so um, many people now are getting trained in ACEs and, um, yeah, that means adverse childhood experiences. And I know you can go in depth about it. She and I had a conversation uh, in my uh, office about it not uh, long ago. And uh, it's, it's pretty revelatory in terms of addressing what's going on uh, with violence in our community especially. And I will say the support of your office for getting our cohort of ACE educators trained here and operational. Anywhere in Baton Rouge, we can come give you this training free of charge for your organization. So it's available and, and the city has been very, very supportive. Let's go to the audience for another question. Uh, 
quickly. Oh. The training can take from an hour to a full day. It can be spaced out over several sessions. As much as you want to know, we can, we can fill you in. Okay. Come this way. Good afternoon, Pat LaDuff. So my question is to the mentor. Can you share with us your childhood? Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about privileged. Um, and what about the mentee that really compels you to do what you do? Well, my childhood was perfect, so. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I don't think anybody believed that, but I got a couple chuckles. Good try. You try. Uh, you know, honestly, um, <clears throat> you could not find two different, more different backgrounds than Ramil and I have had, right? So I, I was born and raised in southern Indiana. Um, my parents were divorced when I was about eight years old. Uh, I do remember a couple of tense times in my life where it was just more of what I would probably characterize now as just bickering comments, you know. And, and um, I, think, I think both my parents would probably agree to the fact that maybe they made some statements that I probably shouldn't have been made in my presence. Um, but I never had to live with the trauma of, uh, of alcoholism. I never had to live with the trauma of child molestation or living in a house where the father was abusive towards the mother. So for me, when I finally got out of Southern Indiana, right? Southern Indiana was 99.5% white, right? So I go off to college and I'm exposed to diversity. I'm exposed to different cultures. And you know, I have to make the decision at that point, am I just gonna live in the shell that everything that I learned in Tell City, Indiana uh, was all there was to learn or was it possibility that there's more things out there, right? Some more ways of growth. Um, so for me, and you got to remember the culture in law enforcement uh, is going to be different from state to state. So I, I don't want to speak to what the culture might be here in Louisiana, but I can tell you that going through the training, the formalized training in Indiana, um, it didn't really change my heart. It didn't change who I was as a person. And I uh, got hired at Avon. I've been there for about 16 years now. I spent about 10 years as an investigations division uh, detective. And my last four or five years has been an administrator. So the last four or five years that I've been on the department, my goal the entire time has been, we want to change a culture, okay? We talked about it in our breakout session. We had several officers that are just doing some amazing things down here. Um, that don't really find themselves on the front page of a paper or on, on a stage like today, just doing some really cool things behind the scenes, regardless of race, color, creed, nationality, whatever that may be. For me, it was about changing culture and setting an example. We can go to a training, right? We can go to a training, we can call it something, and we can say, you know what, we checked the box, we went to this training, and in four hours, that was the joke I think I made in, in, our, in our breakout session, right? We can knock out a four hour training, we can put our name on the roster and we can put it in a file cabinet and say, there you go, we trained on this. Whether that is a, uh, an implicit bias course, maybe it's a, a formalities of how to handle a particular situation or maybe dealing with people with mental illness or trauma, whatever that may be. But if we're serious about making change, we have to realize we're, we're trying to change a culture. We're not gonna change a culture by taking a training and being done with it. If you offer a training, that's great. But when you walk out of that building, what's the organization doing to make that training part of culture? That's what we have to try to find a transition for, right? Thank you. So for me, you know, the biggest thing I hate is a hypocrite, right? And so for me to be a part of an organization to, to want to make that impact and make that change, I wouldn't have been able to tell you at any point in my career that I would meet somebody as half as brilliant as Ramil. And I mean that. And I don't say that because we're on a stage and we're trying to make things, you know, grandioso in any form or fashion. This is a fantastic young man. And he made a terrible mistake, but he's, he's bounced back from that. Yeah. So when I was at Goodwill that day and, and he made the approach uh, and asked me, you know, about, hey, do you remember me and, and wanting to reconnect and then later being part of the mentorship? For me, I thought, what a fool to turn everything that I've thought about doing away just because maybe it was going to eat into my time. Maybe it was going to take away from what my peers might have thought about me if there was this, you know, anti, don't talk to the bad guys sort of mantra out there. To be honest with you, I just said, I don't care about that. I just don't. I just don't care about that. Um, you know, but, and, and the thing about it is, you know, the feedback has been very interesting, right? I've had a lot of people say, oh, what you're doing is great. I've had a few, few people that I would have expected to be a little bit more vocal about the support, just kind of, hey, nice job, walk away. 
right? <laughs> um, so, but my, my thing is, is that's up to them to accept that, right? Because once I'm able to get past the fact that we had a history and, and we know that what that history was, that he came from a good family, much like my family, that his mom did everything right, just like my mom did, right? All moms are perfect, right? We all know that. <laughs> and the fact that the only thing that separated us was our circumstance. And that circumstance does not define our character. It reveals it and gives opportunity to refine it. And so for our circumstances that we have to be able to share this today, you're watching a young man absolutely take advantage of the fact he can share from his mistakes with everybody here, and you're getting to see the refined aspect of his character, not the circumstances that others may project on him to define that character. That just isn't true. So I'm honored to be a part of that. That's what I saw in Ramil. Let's see if we can get into one more question. What are some of the factors in this community that influence trauma? Can someone? What are some of the factors in your community, in this community, that influence trauma? Well, I, can, I had the opportunity to sit in on a listening session uh, with one of our collective healing partners that was uh, facilitated by the NAACP. And, you know, I sat in there and I listened to uh, uh, the diverse, you know, community members that were there. And, and one thing is crime. You know, crime has, uh, there's a lot of trauma. You know, when we, when I listen to victims, uh, uh, family members of victims of violence and how they, their frustration and the trauma turns into blaming law enforcement for not uh, 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 solving the crime mm -hmm. of their loved one. Uh, when I listen to uh, uh, residents talk about how they're sick and tired of the crime that's in their area, they're mm -hmm. tired of hearing the gunshots, they're mm -hmm. tired of knowing who the bad actors are in the neighborhood, and they know, and, and they assume we know, but we're not doing anything about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, all of that, all of that's trauma. And what I've realized is when I listen to the frustration of uh, the community, and it's in different demographics, it's just, it's, it's certain areas, it's in disinvested communities where we historically as law enforcement like to uh, uh, repurpose our resources because that's where crime is high. And there's a disproportionate contact between uh, uh, law enforcement and those who live in those areas because of our strategies and how we address crime-related issues. Uh, but what I, what, I, what I see when, when, when I have these conversations with the community, that there's a lot of hurt and pain. Uh, that there really is. And, and I think that's why it's important. I see our, uh, our CISM coordinators in the back. Uh, that's why it's important for us to educate our police officers. We're getting them to CIT training crisis intervention training to identify uh, mental illnesses. Uh, we're doing the same thing with our CISM so our police officers feel safe uh, when they're responding to calls for services because the last thing we want is a police officer responding to a significant emotional event when he's dealing with some emotional issues mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to create a safe environment so we can give them time out as well. Uh, but, but crime has a, 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 a strong, strong uh, influence in trauma, particularly in disinvested communities. I, I want to add to that. Um, I'm a victim of, of violence because I've lost three brothers to violence, and none of their murders have been solved in New Orleans. Um, so there's a lot of trauma that's in my background, and I've used that... Um, to try to inform others how to deal and to heal and to come out of that trauma. Um, you're, you, I wish I had you in my classroom. I mean, you're a textbook. I mean, what would a teacher want to see in the classroom? Um, using that, your story of what you've been through um, to try to heal others is the, the right direction to go into. And, and in the classroom, you know, I try to get my students to open up and to tell their stories. A lot of people walking around, what we talked about earlier, internalized trauma. They're, a lot of these young people are suffering and they're hurting and they're dealing with real issues um, in the community, whether it be violence, racism, hate. All of these things are dividing our community and our young people are, are smack dead in the middle of it in America 
today with all the stuff that is going on. And we have to allow them to open up and to be able to share their stories and get innovative about it. We can't do what we always did. I, could, I couldn't walk in that classroom after the summer of 2016 and just start teaching like I always taught because I looked out into my students' faces and I realized they were suffering and they were hurting. Some students were outright crying in the classroom. Um, those students' stories that you saw were my real students. They, these are really their stories. I just basically put it on stage, but that was, these were real people. These were real students dealing with real issues in the community. That was their trauma. But I told them that I wanted them to share their trauma, but this was not gonna be a space for hate, for division, we was not gonna use this moment to blame each other, to turn this on each other. We were gonna try to bring something positive out of this trauma. And that's how Voices from the Bayou came about. The students get, thank you. So the intention was to heal. The intention was to bring more love. The intention was to bring unity. And I'm really glad that people on the panel actually received that in that spirit because it'll have been very awkward up here if no one enjoyed the play. <laughs> so when you ask that first question, did they, you know, that it would have been real awkward. So I'm, I'm glad that people are taking it the way that I intended it and the way my students received it. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored, Lamont Rucker, that you came to this community and became a part of this production. Um, you know, you oftentimes meet celebrities and, and people who, um, you know, in the celebrity world and all of that, you know, but you're very real. You've shown my students that, you've shown me that, you care. You're using your art to empower. And that's very beautiful. Um, and all the people up here are doing great work. Our mayor, thank you for supporting BRCC, um, supporting Voices, yes. <laughs> supporting Voices from the Bayou um, through the recast program, um, which is part of the mayor's office and, and through the grants and all the great work. Thank you. I just want to take that opportunity because you've been very supportive of us. Question. And on that note, uh, closing cl remarks, Madam Mayor. I don't really have closing remarks. I have a question. I'll yield to everybody else. Okay. Though. But I have a question of the audience members. Um, do you believe that we need to expose this play on another level in our community? I, I mean, and, yeah, I mean, do you see it being an effective tool for healing for our community? Okay. okay. So I, I'd welcome your feedback. If you were in here and you clapped your hands or you had some ideas as a result of hearing the, uh, watching the play or any experience that you had here today, please email me at mayor at brla.gov. I'd love to hear your feelings about what we can do moving forward. I think Thank it's you. time to take the show on the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, let's make it happen, Captain. <laughs> so maybe, maybe ladies first, since. Just a, just a quick, we actually, we are really out of time. So but we're going to do it. We'll make it can, quick. If Everybody can make it quick. summarize the general feelings for everyone. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you, you said for everyone? <laughs> we want to have a quick vote? We got two, we got three mics. Look, she's handing it over. You keep being bashful. I'm not bashful. This is what I do. So I'll hop in. All right. All right, me and Ramil, me and you, we got it. We're going to take it home. So one of the things I, I, I just want to say, I'm, I mean, I think, again, um, not to be redundant, but again, maybe uh, to just reiterate, uh, speak to the heart, speak from the heart. And um, I believe there are th three relationships, so to speak, that are important. Your relationship with God, however you see God, your relationship to other people and other living things, period, right? That's the planet as animals. That's that little bug you think is, is insignificant, right? Of, of course, obviously, other people, and that might be even people that you're in intimate contact or relationship with, or peop even people who are strangers. There's really no difference, right, to other living things. But I think the most important relationship is your relationship with yourself. And if you are not taking the time every day to invest in yourself and your relationship with yourself, be quiet. Prayer is about clarity, not asking for favors, 
right? Meditation is to be still and listen to what's really going on with you, right? It's your relationship with yourself. And I firmly believe no matter what it is that has happened to you, that is happening to you, or that might happen to you, nothing happens to you, things happen for you. And if you use them as the fuel for empowerment of yourself and other people, no matter what happens to you, no matter what anybody or circumstances even do to you, it's actually preparing you for greater triumph. So we're gonna take this as a lesson about turning trauma into triumph. Uh, hello. So I agree with everything that he said. Everything that he said is concepts on top of concepts. And I encourage you guys to self-educate about the concepts for uh, self-freedom but I did want to just maintain transparency and let you guys know that uh, your community is outstanding. I don't have this back home and all my years of travel, it's the first time I left though, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've never seen or heard nothing like this. I mean, you guys love your community and you guys are pouring back into it. So I just wanna let you know that uh, there's someone in this crowd that's losing hope and they're here on a on a, on a whim, hmm. but stay hopeful because your community loves itself and you're investing in yourself and it's not common, at least not from what I've seen or been a part of. And um, so I just wanna let you guys know that. And I, and I, I know you got closing remarks, but man, you guys sung Pray On It. So I, I just, can we just bow our heads for a yes, second sir. so I can say a quick prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, we come to you today in all humility, and we ask that you guide us, and that you watch over us, and that you just keep hands on us, and that in everything that you do, that you walk with us, yeah. and make it just a little bit easier. Yeah. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. 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 That's a good note to end on. Thanks, everybody. Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.